today would be get to it, put it down here. Preparation for purpose. So I think something that's been on my heart um, has been there's a lot of changes going on in Thames Valley. And that can be a good thing, but it can also be just destabilizing. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we approach the changes that are happening. I'm not the instigator of the changes, um, so I'm not, don't worry, Tim and Chevy have not, you know, not done any chance. We'd really appreciate if you could talk about this. This is genuinely just coming from me and how I'm sort of seeing the big picture. So let us turn <coughs> and start in Matthew 26, verse 17. And they're going to be a bit more interactive today because there's fewer of us. I also deliberately dressed down, knowing full well what I was coming to. It is my birthday as well. So I dressed down, kind of to sort of challenge, challenge the norm that we used to. Um, so I know that at church we have, a, we have an idea of what the preacher wears, right? He's at least got to have closed shoes, <laughs> which I do not have, except for Richard Bailey. Richard Bailey is the only person I know who could get away with preaching without closed shoes. Well, Jesus, he's not in Thames Valley, though. Well, he is, but he's, he is, but you know, you know what I mean. So, um, so I'm, uh, I'm following the way of Richard Bailey and Jesus uh, today. So from verse 17 it says, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city uh, to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to, say to him one after the other, Surely don't you, don't you mean me, Lord? Sorry, surely you don't mean me, Lord? Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I will never. I never will, sorry. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, This very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. So, it's a long, a long passage. I'm still trying to make sure I eke out the full hour and a half we've got left. <laughs> um, there's a lot. It's obviously just one scenario we're looking at. But there's a lot going on in the scenario. Um, there's Jesus, who is fully aware of the big picture. And there are his disciples, who are completely unaware unaware of exactly what's happening. They know it's not good. They know that, you know, there's, you get the sense there's this uneasiness, right? There's talk of betrayal. One of the disciples will betray Jesus. There's then 
talk of, you know, eat this, my body, um, then drink of this wine, which is the blood, which will be poured out for forgiveness of sins, and a covenant. Um, these, are, these are big, big themes being spoken about, you know, and certainly, you know, even when we hear for the first time that someone talks to you about communion and they say, well, communion is, you, you know, this is the body of Christ. Is he sat? And even that concept for us is like, okay, that's a bit odd. What do, what do you mean? So you can imagine them must be going, hmm, is he alright? <laughs> is, is he still okay? Because there's some really um, revolutionary ideas that Jesus is starting to talk about at this point. And this is not the first time he is uh, preparing them. And that's where I want, want us to see is that right at this point, this is Jesus preparing his disciples. They're not ready to be prepared, but he is preparing them nonetheless. And it gets to the point where after they've taken the bread and the wine and they probably not fully understand understood what that means, that then Jesus now talk, starts talking about all of them falling away on account of him. And what that means to me is that they all fell away because of Jesus. They didn't, they didn't fall away because it, um, I don't know, you know, it was hard. Or it didn't fall away because it's a bit inconvenient. They, they fell away because of Jesus was about to do something so extraordinary that it was going to push them away. So it was the fact of what, like, Jesus is dying on the cross. Jesus is being hated by all these people. Therefore, they hate us. Therefore, we don't want to be associated with him because then we're next in line. So there are some really big things. And there's some pretty bold statements coming back as well. You know, poor old Peter gets the rap here. I mean, he really is... I always say he's got foot in mouth syndrome. Not foot out mouth, he's got foot in mouth syndrome. And he just he just gives it a hundred percent. He's like, no ways. Just no chance, Jesus. I mean, I don't know, I know you're God in the flesh, but you're wrong. Because <laughs> there's no ways I, I will die with you tonight if I need to. And Jesus is like, really? <laughs> Before the rooster crows in about eight or nine hours, or ten hours time, you would have disowned me three times. And obviously, that must be. I, you get the impression, Peter. You, you don't actually see what Peter says about that, but you must feel like you're probably thinking, no, no, just no. He doesn't even respond. He's just like, it just can't happen, because he cannot see how this is going to unravel. And I wanted to kind of talk about this because what's about to happen is they're about to be scattered. They're about to be, um, their hearts are about to be revealed for where they really are. And a huge cataclysmic change is about to occur. You know, it's been great for them. They've had the teacher living with them for three years, walking every step of the way. You know, when they trip up, when it gets difficult, you can pull them back up from the waves. You know, when they get scared on the boat, Jesus is there to kind of steady the ship. When there's 5,000 people to feed and they're overwhelmed, Jesus is there to kind of guide them. All of this, they've had Jesus with them. And he's now saying, it's not going to be so comfortable now. Now it's going to get a little bit tricky. And I kind of, no one can compare what's going on in Thames Valley with the night of the... Um, the, the night that we're talking about of the Last Supper. There's just no comparison whatsoever. But big changes can reveal our hearts. Absolutely. Big changes that things that we're used to. And I, I was thinking about like, you know, what are what are the what are the changes that have happened? We'll get onto that a little bit more in a, in a minute. Um, but but I know that these disciples weren't ready for the change. We know that because they disowned Jesus. If they'd been ready, they wouldn't have disowned Jesus. But they weren't ready. And so their true hearts were revealed. And it was kind of like, this is their chance to go into the furnace, right? They'd been prepared, but they still needed to go into the fire to be purified. 
And so you can't just be purified based on pure theology, if that makes sense. You can't just learn being a disciple as an academic subject and then be like, awesome, I've got it. That doesn't prepare you to be a disciple. What prepares you to be a disciple is just living like a Christian and going through the challenges that it provides. And so I know for me, my heart has been challenged because I've seen a lot of changes in Thames Valley in the last year alone. And it kind of started when we lost Bracknell. And it was like, oh, okay, I mean, it's just a building, right? It's just a room. But then it was like, okay, so now we've got to go to Reading, okay? That's a bit further from Nicole and I to go. That's, that's not a big issue. I'm fairly used to driving far distances to come to church. So that wasn't really a big issue. But then it was like, that's only once a month. And then obviously, at the same time, the church was spreading, as in geographically, we're getting wider. And so there were all these things like that started at that point. And I, suddenly I was like, I don't see so-and-so so frequently anymore. And these guys I don't see, not because they're not going to church, but just because they're meeting somewhere else. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe they have stopped going to church. Um, and so I, I had this feeling of, for the last year, this sort of unease about, this is, this is difficult. I was finding it difficult. Um, so, I want to ask you what, do you, what do you think in this passage that we read here? What, what did the disciples do? Well, first of all, do you think they are prepared at this point for what's about to come? about to get taken away, they've never had taken away. Yeah. Um, so in that regard, they were not prepared. Um, what do you think they needed to be prepared for? What do you think Jesus was trying to prepare them for? I think uh, he's trying to let them to prepare for the challenges ahead of what they are about to face. Mm -hmm. There are That's challenges good. like, um, I mean, you know, but what is coming Definitely, they need to prepare towards it. Uh, because if you look at Peter, Peter is now ready to die with Christ. Mm -hmm. So, but Christ, Jesus wants them just to see that all what they are about to do, there is a, a great challenge in whatever they are about to do. Yep. So you should prepare for it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and ultimately, <coughs> Peter did die. We know where he got to, right, in the end. But it wasn't just through the words of Jesus, it was through living out what Jesus had commanded. It wasn't just through hearing it once or twice. Um, so I think for me, what I, what I see is, and I'm reading a book, so this is why I've related this to this, but I, I think, I see how Jesus uses grace and truth to prepare his disciples. But he also doesn't, hold back from letting them experience what they need to experience. Which is kind of the truth aspect that we're talking about. And I know I've heard lots of discussions and sermons about, you know, we need to be a church of grace and a church of truth and, and we need to have a balance and, and that's all absolutely bang on. And in this book that I've been reading, which is um, by Dr. Henry Cloud, which says change, called Changes That Heal, uh, the opening chapter is just about grace and truth. And it's really enlightening. Not to the point where you feel like, okay, this is not a new concept, but certainly he brings it into a central 
message that's really easy to understand, really easy to see the shortfalls of both having only grace or having only truth. And what became apparent to me is how, you know, we just need both, which basically is the fullness of Christ. Mm -hmm. Because in John chapter 1, verse 14, and you don't need to turn there, I'll read it for you, it says, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That's obviously Jesus is talking about. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Further down, in verse 17 it says, or actually I'll read, I'll read all of it, in 15 it says, John testified concerning Him. He cried out saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he, has, he was before me. That's John the Baptist. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace, uh, in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So there's this, Jesus doesn't just say, guys, you know, pat them on the back, it's going to be okay. What he's prepared to do is tell them actually the ugliness of what's about to happen. The ugliness is you're going to disown me and you're going to betray me and actually I won't even hold back on the consequence of that. The consequence of you betraying me is it would have been better for you not to be born. Imagine having to tell someone that you've lived with, loved dearly for three years that actually what you're about to do it would be better if you hadn't been born. I and mean, that must be hard for Jesus even to say that. But I appreciate how he doesn't hold back when the truth is required. But at the same time, we see in, that, in those verses before, we see that he's actually giving grace. He's saying that, yeah, you guys are going to mess up, but actually what we're taking now, this covenant, this is about forgiveness. This is about acceptance. I accept you how you are. I don't accept you just as perfect Fabian, so when you've reached perfection, then you're good enough for me, or perfect Jean, or perfect Iggy. Actually, Jesus is saying, I accept you how you are, but you still need to know the truth. Because grace without truth is like, it's not a real relationship, right? Real relationship is honesty. You, without truth, there's no honesty. And we need that. And Jesus doesn't hold back. But what he has, what we see here is the full measure of his love. To have grace and truth to help his disciples. And so, in, in this book that I was reading by Dr. Henry Cloud, he uses a well-known example, the woman caught in adultery, as a great example of where Jesus uses both grace in abundance and enough truth for her to know what to do. So we see that when she's caught in adultery, she's brought to Jesus by the uh, elders um, or the Pharisees, and they want to stone her. Jesus challenges them after a while. He so he writes on the ground, and then eventually, I'm paraphrasing all of this, but he, he challenges them to say, right, whoever's without sin, may he cast the first stone. <coughs> And so at that point, you think to yourself, okay, there is, you know, these guys start to go away one by one. And we often think about this in the context of the woman. Oh, this is amazing. Look at the grace Jesus brought. He's not condemned her. And he also he says, has any of them condemned you? And they've all gone away. And she says, no, not one. He says, neither do I. What's interesting for me is, he could have condemned the Pharisees. But he even had grace for them. Even they walked away without having to be ridiculed or like, look, yeah, you know, he didn't go out there single-handedly say, you did this. He could have. He could have said, yeah, you did that. You cheated here. You lied there. You know, and pointed out their sins because he knew them. But he didn't. He gave them grace as well. We often think about, the, you know, the fact that this is just about the woman. But I think also he's set an example for everyone in that scenario. There's enough truth that those who are without sin throw the first stone. So immediately he's revealed the truth. No one here can point fingers. 
and then they walk away and he doesn't condemn anyone. And so there's this overwhelming grace. And for the woman, he says, he finishes up with her saying, now leave your life of sin. And so he doesn't withhold the truth from her either. You see, he accepts her as the adulterer, the adulterous woman. He doesn't only accept her once she's repented. He, he just accepts her for who she is. And, and that's what we need to do. So when we have these situations, you're thinking, what's this got to do with changes going on in Thames Valley? But I think for me, this has been helpful to be like, you know, I could, I could point fingers and I say, oh, why are we changing this? And why are we changing that? And is this going to be better? The reality is that, <coughs> that I need to have grace in these situations. Um, and I also need to be prepared to speak the truth if I do see something that's not great. Um, which, by the way, I'm not saying I see anything that's not great. But I'm aware, just like the disciples, that these changes might reveal in us some areas where we perhaps have, haven't counted the cost or forgotten the cost we counted uh, once upon a time. You know, when I think about the things we're changing, um, these are the things that came to mind. So we lost Bracknell. That was difficult, I think. Um, and so then we started meeting in Reading. I mean, Reading was a great place. I loved the balcony outside afterwards. Um, we then ended up using the hall with mirrors at Bracknell, which I think most people would accept wasn't ideal. Certainly audio, you know, wasn't particularly awesome. Um, but at the same time, we've had Surrey Heath and Borders being planted, which uh, I've been part of, and been super encouraging to see Obi and Peju in particular, you know, just leading the way, um, setting an outstanding example. We've seen greater emphasis on locations, with the church spreading ever wider. Um, and that, all those things have led to, like I say, people I don't see that frequently anymore. Um, and it's made me wonder, like, well, you know, where are they? What's going on? I feel sometimes a lack of connectedness. And there are more changes to come. Soon we'll have New Friday and Sunday look at, um, place to of worship. I think it's great. I've been there. I loved it. As a parent, I loved it because it had great playing facilities outside, had classrooms. It was, it was great. I really loved it. Um, and I know we've been ex next week, this Friday, sorry, coming, we're going to experiment with having Friday nights in our own locations. That's new for us, right? I know that some of the old guard, I'm the old guard, right? I've been a disciple for over 20 years. Wow. Um, I, I, I'm, I consider myself now mature in the sense I've been around a long time, not necessarily always mature, but I've been around a while. It can be difficult to see, like, well, what does that mean? What does that mean that, you know, are we going to still be, you know, are, are we going to achieve what we want to achieve um, if we're not meeting together? You know, the Bible says we should continue meeting together. Does this mean we're not meeting together? You know, or, you know, will, will we be effective? Will we be able to help people get to know Christ through these changes? All these things have been going on in my mind. I've been wondering, wow, wow, this is, this is challenging, you know, challenging my faith, because is my faith in the fact that we meet on a Friday night? Is my blueprint for Christianity meeting on a Friday and a Sunday? Or is it actually more about the fundamentals? That actually God's not interested whether it's a Friday or a Sunday or a Thursday morning or whenever you might meet, but more about our hearts. And I think that for me is what this will reveal. These changes will reveal our hearts. Um, and I know that um, you know in the kingdom we have to be concerned with the hundredth sheep not, not just the ninety-nine and I, I have concern that in changes like these people will fall through the gaps and you need to ask yourself are you one of the people that might fall through the gaps or do you know someone who might fall through the gaps we have people who are weaker than others or more vulnerable or whatever it may be I want to encourage us to think about everyone in our in Thames Valley. Think about, I haven't seen so and so, let me give them a call, how are you doing? You know, meeting in the mornings, that's a big change for Thames Valley. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm all for it, I love meeting in the mornings. 
But I know that that is going to be revealing because it, while it suits me, that's great, I, I, I'm a fan, it's not going to suit everyone. I know that. I know that people will have leisure activities planned on a Sunday morning. They'll have other things they're already doing on a Sunday and now church is going to essentially interrupt that. And I know the question is going to be, you know, where are, where are our hearts in those situations? You know, so I know how changes can, can challenge us. Last year, Nicole damaged her leg somehow, we don't know how. She's not been able to walk properly for 18 months now. Um, still not going that well. And so she had to shut her business. Um, so not only could she not walk, she couldn't do the job she was doing. And so we had to now plan for her to study something else where she could do it, where she didn't have, you know, she was literally manhandling bouncy castles. So she needed a good leg, more than one good leg, she needed two good legs. Um, but this was a huge upheaval for us. And, you know, honestly, we weren't prepared. You know, how can you be, you can't be prepared for like, hey, this is just gonna, everything you're used to for the last few years or the way of life, this just wiped us out. And, and what happened is, this is the spiritual consequence of that. And you wouldn't necessarily think of it immediately. But when it came to giving for a uh, special contribution last year, and I haven't told anyone this, but Nicole and I didn't give last year. And I felt guilty and ashamed that we didn't give. And I could justify, because we now didn't have the income we had, or the things we, you know, all the plans we had, I can justify it. But that change was really revealing about me. It got me worrying about money. Concerned. It may not be greed per se, but certainly there was a lack of spiritual trust in God at that point that I could still give. And like I said, I gave nothing, not even a fiver. And I could have. But my heart wasn't in the right place. My heart wasn't prepared for the change. You know, I wasn't open about it either. I wasn't open about sharing my, okay, this is really difficult this year. I just made an executive decision for us that we're not going to get. And, and that, was, that wasn't right. And I, I felt that afterwards, that that wasn't the right thing to have done. But had I been connected, had I had a bit of truth, some grace, and I, and I decided to be one of the body and share what was going on, then I could have got help. I could have had people to help me out in that situation. And so my concern is that as we have these big changes, that our hearts will be revealed and some of us are going to miss times. We're not going to be connected with the body. And so the consequences I've suffered, the church will suffer. And so I want us to not suffer that. I want us to be connected. I want to be connected. I was thinking about it today. I was like, imagine how different it would have been if I'd just been open to, with someone about what I was thinking. That would have made a huge difference. And so that's what I want to encourage us. I want to encourage us to be open about the fact that these changes for some people are great, and for other people are difficult. I'm not trying to tell us it's going to be a disaster or it will be... Amazing, I don't know. I have no idea. But I am aware, very aware, that these changes will reveal things that are difficult for us. Mm. And that's okay. That's where we need grace. But we also need the truth to help keep us together. I, I'm not saying we have to meet on a Friday. Honestly, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is we need to be the church, the kingdom. We need to seek first the kingdom. And we need to have relationship. That is what God wants us to have. He wants it with Him, but we need it with each other. And sometimes, to get to God, we need to go through each other a little bit. Sometimes we're the instruments that God will use to get to Him. And I can use that as an example. Just um, on Friday, we weren't there. Yeah, I'm preaching about Friday nights and to be committed. Friday night, we weren't there. Because my kids have both got chicken pox. So... I mean, honestly, it was like DEFCON 3. I don't know which is the worst DEFCON, but honestly, it was serious nuclear meltdown going down to my house on Friday night. So we'd been to the hospital twice during the week. One, because we thought Shanna had meningitis, which uh, was a bit scary. But 
we, um, luckily that wasn't the case. But then by Friday, the itch had taken over and it was literally the itchy and scratchy show in our house on Friday night and Shanna couldn't sleep. So what happened is on Friday, I, on Friday night I sat with Shanna from 7.30 when she went to bed. Initially I left her in her bed and then she came out like 10 minutes later, Daddy, I'm too itchy. And so then I sat with her and I thought, okay, if I can just sit with her, then I can help her fall asleep. And our kids sleep in the same room together. So I had to get Kaylin out, so I evacuated Kaylin, who also had started with chicken pox, but she wasn't so itchy yet. So she slept in our room. Um, and I was like, I'll just sit with Shanna. And then initially, I was so frustrated. Honestly, I can't tell you how frustrated I was. I was like, oh, this is so bad. I just want to go down and watch telly. I mean, <laughs> sorry, revealing how selfish one can be. Um, but I'm sat there literally holding her hand, and she's like, Daddy, it's so itchy. And then I'm wetting cloths and dabbing her, and I mean, stay cool and stop itching. It took me a while, and I had to just pray. That's all I could do. I was like, God, I, she keeps asking me to take it away. And as I said, I can't. I just cannot take it away. So I just prayed and prayed and prayed. I, I, I could do nothing else. And she was like, Daddy, why, will, why does God make things like chicken pox? <laughs> I'm like, seriously, I'm not prepared to answer that question. But like, literally, I'm not prepared to. I don't have an answer. I don't know why God does that. But there is some amount of growth, and it might, it might just be for me. It might have nothing to do with you. It might be about Daddy. You need to be more patient. And so on Friday night, I didn't get to sleep properly until half past four. I, I'm, I'm not joking. Until three o'clock in the morning, I didn't sleep. I was up with her, and she didn't sleep. And I just had to pray. And at one point, she said, Daddy, I'm really sorry. Why don't you just you, you sleep? And I just thought, I thought of this passage, and I thought, you know what? Now's your time of need. The only thing I can do is pray. It's not my time to sleep. And I was thinking about the disciples when Jesus was in Gethsemane and they slept. And I was thinking, I know that you can't compare the two, but it felt like she was the one in need. She could do nothing about it. She wanted me to take it away. She couldn't. I couldn't. And so all I could do is just try and pray with her and pray silently to myself and then honestly asking God for all sorts of miracles. But something that did happen, which was amazing, was the following morning, um, a sister, I won't reveal who she was, a sister just turned out of, up at our door out of the blue. She knocked on our door. I was not in the right clothes to be receiving a sister into my house at that time in the morning. So I had to rush upstairs because Nicole was like, John T, you can't be down here without a shirt. Get, go up. And I was like in my sleeping clothes. And uh, so I ran upstairs and the sister brought us lasagna and food. She just, we hadn't asked, we had we just, all we'd done the night before, say guys, we want to be at church, the kids have got chicken pox. And she brought it on her own. No one requested her to do it. And I, I don't want to reveal her name because I don't want to shout, you know, I do want to bigger her up. But she did it in, she didn't do it to get any praise or show. It's between her and God. And I can appreciate that. And so, that for me, blew me away. I was like, that's the connectedness, the grace, the truth, the, that's what we need in the kingdom. Not just Friday nights. You know, that's what we really need. Being able to be open with each other, tell us the challenges that are going on. And I really appreciated that. So I'm going to finish up now in, um, in actually there's something else that I had a chat with Heinrich and Bianca. We saw them on Thursday night before the meltdown in our house with chicken pox. Um, and they were sharing their, we were just talking about all those changes and stuff, and they were sharing that from the Yopros side, they were saying like, they've been scattered this, this summer. Like, Alice is going to Southampton, Alex Clegg is going to London, Alex Heath has gone to Bournemouth, um, uh, Francois Kurtz has moved to Sweden. Yeah. Um, it's like half their ministry, more than half their ministry, gone. And he was like, I just, he was like, he felt discouraged about it. And he was like, 
And I was like, wow, oh, you know, that, that is hard when that, when that happens, those changes. You do feel discouraged, all this work you put in. But I was so encouraged just to have that conversation with him. Not because I had an answer or I could fix it, but to know that, hey, you know what? God is with us and God will bless that. God blessed the disciples being scattered. Mm -hmm. And this is what Jesus did. We'll quickly turn there. John said, you know, at this moment, after Jesus had revealed to them what was the cataclysmic night they were about to have, this is actually what he said. It says, Jesus prays for his disciples in John 17, verse 19. My prayer is not for them alone. So he's talking about the twelve. When he says them alone. Um, he says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me. That they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me, have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, know the world does not know you, though the world does not know you. I know you, and they know you have sent me, I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Yeah. I love the fact that Jesus knows how hard it's going to be. He knows that, man, it's going to be challenging at times, things are going to upset us, things are not going to go our way, um, it's going to be difficult, and his answer is to pray for us. Pray for us to be one. Mm -hmm. And that's my, that's my goal. If I, could, if I had one theme, is I wanted to prepare us for our purpose, which is to be unified. Mm -hmm. That in these changes, you know, and I know challenges, right? I know having kids is a challenge, and then getting there on a Friday night is a challenge. I know that morning services will be difficult for some. I know that not seeing people that you used to see every second week in Bracknell last year is difficult because those relationships may not feel like they're there anymore. Or people may have left. You know, like I said, this may reveal that some people will leave. I don't know. I don't want that. But I really want to encourage us to be prepared to take on the challenge of these changes with, you know, just that cost of, I'm here to be a disciple. I'm not coming just because it's on a Friday or because someone, John T, said I should be there. But I want to be connected to grace and truth to the rest of the believers. That's what I have for us today. Amen. Sorry. Yes. So at this time we're going to, obviously we've spoken a lot about, you know, the, change, the challenges we have, but we obviously read a passage there about communion. And the, the very first communion that we had, or that the disciples had, um, and ultimately, that's you know the miracle they didn't realize. You know what scattered them was the best single best event in the history of the world. Our, our, you know, sad as it may be at the time, it was something necessary for us and for them. It was the thing that brought us in to have connection with God, to have a relationship with Him. Without Jesus dying the cross we wouldn't have we wouldn't be sat here today and so at this time let's um, uh, just remember how awesome Jesus was in going through something really monumental for us um, and just remember the covenant um, and I, I always think of that word you know the covenant that this is a this is beyond a deal this is just a, a promise that cannot be broken um, that Jesus has given us let us pray for the bread and the wine and yes Jesus Father Dear, dear Heavenly Father God, we uh, come before you today just to thank you for uh, the opportunity to hear your word, um, the opportunity to be encouraged, the opportunity to remember that Jesus came down on this world, in, in this world and lived a life that we can relate to, that he can relate to us, 
Um, but also, Father, he ultimately was prepared to die uh, a death for us so that we can have a relationship with him and with you. Father, we thank you for this bread and this wine, uh, the bread which represents his body and the wine which represents uh, his blood that he was so willing to share for us. Father, we thank you for this in your son's, uh, in your son's mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen.